summit was quite an eventful one, and I hope all our speakers, ambassadors, and our delegates from both ASEAN and India uh, enjoyed the inaugural session and had a fun evening too. As we move into the second day of the Youth Summit, I welcome you all to the first panel of the day, which is on ASEAN-India connectivity. To chair the session, may I invite Captain Alok Bansal, Director, India Foundation, on the dais, please. Joining us today for this extremely interesting session, which is much of a relevance, which is ASEAN-India connectivity, May I invite Ambassador Ina Krishnamurti, Indonesian Ambassador to India. May I now invite Ambassador Patarat Hong Tong, Thailand Ambassador to India. And joining us today, Ambassador Said Akbaruddin, Dean Kautilya School of Public Policy. May I now invite Captain Alok Bansal to take forward the session. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I think welcome to the first uh, substantive session of this conference, which is taking place after the inaugural. And I think when we talk of India and ASEAN, the most important aspect is connectivity. Connectivity has been the buzzword as far as India ASEAN is concerned. We, I think both the groupings know that the opportunities lie there. Connectivity has been there. We have had an excellent maritime connectivity for a number of years. Uh, overland connectivity we are still working on. So, what we need to do, what we should go about, and we have three excellent speakers in this particular session. We have uh, Ambassador Ina H. Krishnamurti. Her Excellency is Indonesia's ambassador to India. And what's more important is that she has been in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs dealing with economic diplomacy before coming here. So she knows what it economic diplomacy is and how important connectivity is for economic diplomacy. Of course, the second speaker is uh, Her Excellency Patarat Hong Tong, the ambassador, uh, Thai ambassador to India. Uh, she would also be speaking because, as I said, maritime connectivity is still okay, uh, but it is the overland connectivity. We are looking at trilateral highways, we are looking at multi uh, highways from South Asia to Southeast Asia, what's happening. And of course, our final speaker is going to be Ambassador Sayyid Akbaruddin. I think all Indians know him very well. He was the most articulate diplomat that I think the Indian diplomatic services ever had. He was a permanent representative at the United Nations. And I think most Indians are very familiar with him. And I think uh, he would also be speaking to us and enlightening us. So without much ado, uh, I'll request uh, the speakers, they could take 15 to 20 minutes so that we have adequate times for uh, interactions because we have a large number of delegates here who may have questions. So I'll start with uh, Ambassador Ina Krishnamurti with her background in economic diplomacy. I think she can start the, set the ball rolling. Over to you. Honorable Mr. Alok Bansal, Director of India Foundation, distinguished uh, panel, my friend, Ambassador of Thailand, and also my old friend, uh, we met and served in New York together, Ambassador Shed Akbaruddin. Dear youth delegates, oh, I see JS Indo-Pacific MEA, Dear youth delegates from India and ASEAN member countries, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum, namaskar. Very good morning. May peace and health be upon us all. First, 
and foremost, thank you to uh, the Ministry of External Affairs and India Foundation for inviting me. This event that, that gathers the future generation of the world leaders from India and ASEAN is an excellent way to strengthen the understanding between all countries, but also to deepen the exploration for future cooperation and collaboration through people-to-people -people contact. As ASEAN and India celebrates its 30 years of a strong partnership, we actually celebrate the relationship between 2 billion people, almost 1.4 billion from India, and 670 million people of ASEAN. It is a marriage, so I see, between two vibrant economies with long-standing interaction of its people, history, social, and culture for more than two millennia. And it is our duty to strive to connect the past, the present, and the future. Ladies and gentlemen, when I was asked to be part of this panel, I questioned myself. I want to really understand the significant meaning of connectivity. In, because we are in Hyderabad, in the words of Rudolf Rucker, one of the founders of cyberpunk literary movement, the human race is a single vast tapestry linked by our shared food and air. In this sense, it is correct that the entire human race is connected through the material world. The director speaks about connectivity of uh, water, the Indian Ocean, and also road. In international relations, when we think of humanity, we do not think of single, homogenous, peaceful body, but a number of distinct groups such as you, who are sometimes competing, coercing, or cooperating to achieve common goals. Furthermore, none of these groupings, including you, exist independently of the individual humans within them. The individual is the basic unit at which humanity exists. In this way, individuals are symbiotic with the wider system, with each playing a role in shaping and influencing the other. Given this notion, what does it mean for humanity to be connected? The uniting of many individuals like you of a common cause represent a connection of minds leading to action. Such unity can, of course, arise by complete chance or through non-conscious actions. However, more powerful connections arise when the unity stems from conscious interaction. Central to the concept of connectivity, therefore, is the ability to communicate with others. It is exactly for this reason we are meeting at this summit, to build a stronger conscious interaction, to advance P2P communications, to flourish concrete actions and deliverables. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that we all have no doubt that greater connectivity will bring people positive impacts for people to people in both regions. Physical connectivity, in fact, is one of the backbones, the director has mentioned, of any strong and sustainable partnership. The Act East policy have been instrumental in enhancing physical connectivity between India and ASEAN countries. Efforts that the government of India has shown to promote greater physical connectivity between the northeastern region of India with ASEAN countries deserve a praise. Not only this connectivity will indeed significantly unlock the potentials of northeastern states, 
but also it will deliver economic and development benefits to the people in India and ASEAN. In the context of Indonesia and India, the Joint Task Force, or JTF, on connectivity development between Aceh province and Andaman Nicobar Islands is aimed at enhancing connectivity to promoting regional prosperity in the Indo-Pacific and in line with the Act East policy of India. The JTF cooperation has the potential to complement the connectivity initiatives in the Northeast region, especially in terms of increase, increasing connectivity for the region and countries which is located around the Bay of Bengal. Some people in Indonesia doubting whether Indonesia and India is close. Ladies and gentlemen, we are a neighboring countries. Sabang, which is the uh, most, west, uh, the most west island of Aceh, is neighboring uh, with Andaman and Nicobar Island. Ladies and gentlemen, physical connectivity is only one aspect of our partnership. People-to-people -people connectivity is just as important. It is a strong, soft power in fostering deeper relationship between the two regions. By bringing our people together, we can build greater understanding and appreciation for our, one another's culture, values, and traditions. This, in turn, can help to foster a more peaceful and stable region and create opportunities for future generations. In ASEAN, as you may know, there are three pillars of community which cover four Ps. The first pillar of ASEAN political security represents the first P which is peace. The second pillar, which covers economy, is to cover the vision of the second P, which is prosperity. The third pillar is social cultural pillar. It is one of the most important ones, I believe, because it covers people and planet. To achieve its vision as a community, including in its continuous engagement with partner countries such as India, ASEAN is driven by the people principles, people-oriented, people-centered. And in this regard, the depth of ASEAN and India P2P relations cannot and should not be ignored and taken for granted. Socio-historical relations between Ramayana and temples in India and Southeast Asia, last night the minister talked about this, are the witness of this strong bond. On political concept, both sides are also champions of Indo-Pacific concept through the ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific and Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative. On economic relations, trade and investment within India and ASEAN countries rose to 110.40 billion US dollars and 117.88 billion US dollars. The list could go and on and on and on and on. Ladies and gentlemen, with this notion of already solid relation, should we be complacent of our partnership? I believe we need to do more. We need to build an even stronger partnership by benefiting the already solid historical, social, economic, political footprints between ASEAN and India. That is why Indonesia, as the chair of ASEAN 2023, hopes that India, as a strong ASEAN strategic partner, would lend its support in delivering the theme of our chairmanship, which is ASEAN Matters Epicentrum of Growth. With ASEAN Matters, Indonesia is determined to make ASEAN important and relevant for the people of ASEAN and beyond. With the sub theme of Epicentrum of Growth, Indonesia is determined to make Southeast Asia the center for regional economic growth. During our chairmanship, Indonesia will also hold a flagship event that is ASEAN Indo-Pacific Infrastructure Forum with the theme of propelling the next wave of sustainable infrastructure 
with three sub teams green infrastructure inclusive digital transformation and sustainable and innovative financing this forum is aimed at promoting concrete deliverables in the form of infrastructure projects to enhance connectivity in the indo-pacific region through showcasing infrastructure projects to be collaborated facilitating commitments and investment on infrastructure projects and promoting financing of infrastructure projects from ASEAN partners, especially India, international financial institutions, and banking sectors. This forum will be conducted with the spirit of inclusivity, and we would like to have each ASEAN partners, especially India, to take part. I believe that this forum will bring tangible outcomes with benefits people in ASEAN and Indo-Pacific region. Ladies and gentlemen, with a backdrop of global economic and political dynamics that is full of uncertainty and challenges, Indonesia's foreign minister in many occasions always underlines that international community needs to focus on promoting three important elements. Strategic trust instead of trust deficit. Engagement instead of containment. And the spirit of collaboration instead of conflict. That element need to be transpired and nurtured in our cooperation. Above anything else, both India and Indonesia need a mission to create a connectivity of collaboration among countries in the Indo-Pacific region. Because I trust we all are wanting to achieve a region of common security, common stability, common prosperity. With those final remarks, I would like to again congratulate Government of India and India Foundation for this summit and express my sincere best wishes for the success of the summit. Thank you. Good morning. Namaskar. Thank you, Your Excellency. I think you've set the ball rolling. Uh, she talked about people-to-people -people connectivity, and I think this summit is our humble at effort at people-to-people -people connectivity. I think at the end of the summit, you all delegates will let us know whether we have made some efforts towards this end, which has been a successful effort or not. She also talked about cultural connect. She talked about Ramayana. And when we talk of Ramayana, I think the country that comes to mind, which had Ayodhya as its capital for a number of years, is Thailand. So I'll now request uh, Her Excellency Ambassador of Thailand to make her comments. Um, Chair of the sessions, Mr. Alok Bansal, Directors of Indian Foundation, and also um, General Katuk, the directors of the Indian Foundations, JS Kitika, the JS of Indo-Pacific uh, Divisions, as well as my um, um, colleague speakers, Ambassador Ina Krishna Mulatis of Indonesia, Ambassador Sayid Akbaruddin, um, and also distinguished guests, and of course, um, the dear participants from all ASEAN countries, including India's today. So, Swadika and Namaskar. In Thai, we say Swadika, mean uh, the way to greet and also to say goodbye as well. Actually, um, it, I'm so, you know, my great pleasure that I could be able to return to Hyderabad once again. This is my second time in um, this beautiful city, but this time is a bit different that we are not in the um, downtown. I hope that according to the program that the, the, all the participants, the youth from ASEAN countries will be able to visit the center of the Hyderabad, the historic city. You will see how charming it is for, for Hyderabad and you will learn a lot of history as well as the wealth of this city. So this time, even though I'm not be able to be in town, but it's also my, my honor to be among with all of you who are the youth that have been selected from the particular countries and to speak in front of you about the connectivities.
for you to have the pictures of how ASEAN and India have been connected. So I personally believe that you know, it's so crucial to engage with the, our young generations who will be the, you know, the people who shaped the futures. And uh, I'm always feel you know, it, it's kind of in work in, invigorating you know, whenever you meet the young people. And of course, it's so difficult for me to speak after Her Excellency Ambassador Ina, since she's really good speakers, and you know, it's so difficult to, to catch up whatever that she has never mentioned. So I will try my best to add up on top of what uh, Ambassador Ina has already mentioned from my uh, point of view. So, and before I start some of my point of view, I also like to extend my grateful gratitude towards Ministry of External Affairs of India and also the India Foundation for organizing these very important events. So I'm sure that uh, during a uh, few days that all the youth from um, the regions in Southeast Asia and India get together, this will shape the meaningful um, friendship for the years to come. And for this event as well, it is really timely. Not only we celebrated the 30 year anniversary of India ASEAN relations last year, but we also established the, a comprehensive strategic partnership that has been elevated during the ASEAN India summit uh, last year in Phnom Penh. So, this is a true reflection of the breadth and depth of ASEAN India relations. And by intensifying people-to-people -people interactions through this summit, it will surely further strengthen our relations in the years to come. So having mentioned it, I'd like to say that people-to-people -people connectivity, I have to start with people-to-people -people because we, 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 are, we are people. So no doubt plays an important role in fostering the mutual understanding and deepened ties among our people. Ambassador Ina has mentioned that The, it is the backbone of the sustainable um, um, partnership between ASEAN and India. So beside the summit, actually, we have here with us the scholars and also the fellowships under the ASEAN India Network University, who will be the speaker for the rest of the sessions. So this will also help you, the youth who come a long way, to be connected with ASEAN scholars and, and the invited scholars. And in that addition to this, I would like to mention about people-to-people -people, uh, connect that have been um, engaged last year. MEA, Ministry of External Affairs of India, successfully organized um, two events together to promote the connections of youth. One is the ASEAN India Artist Camp in October last year, and is now continued to some of ASEAN countries, including Cambodia and last last two weeks in Thailand, that uh, you brought 10 artists from each country of ASEAN to work together, stay together in Udaipu. And they could create uh, the paintings and also the artworks, and they brought back to ASEAN India Summit in Phnom Penh and now um, exhibit in some countries in ASEAN. So the, the, that is a way to engage people in the, among the artists of these regions, including India. And the second one is the ASEAN India Music Festival in New Delhi, and also I think uh, you went to northeastern regions, Meghalaya as well. So this happened in November. So we could enjoy how the artists, the, the musicians, came a long way from each their own countries and performed in front of ASEAN Indian people. So it could help you know, uh, connect people in India and the peoples in our countries. So both events I participate by myself. So I'm so impressed by, by those events and believe that uh, they were definitely another effective means to strengthen our people to people linkages. And on our side, um, the ASEAN New Delhi Committee, perhaps you, I should like to mention a bit that um, in India, we have all ASEAN, uh, the ambassador and high commissioner from all ASEAN member countries, and we form our um, connectivity in terms of ASEAN New Delhi Committee. So we call it NDC, which during under Thailand's chairmanship, um, we organized the first time ever um, ASEAN India Bazaar in this January at our premise. And 
Um, this event, I noticed that we have received an overwhelming responses which reflect the great interest the Indians and also the public calls in India have for ASEAN countries and vice versa. So we hope that we can do more of this kind of activity in India, in Delhi, together with the cooperations of the Indo-Pacific divisions. And ASEAN in India should therefore keep this kind of momentum going by continuing to organize such activities and initiatives this year, not only for the occasions of the uh, celebrations of the 30 years of an anniversaries of our de uh, relations. And um, I would like to suggest that perhaps the Indian government should think, or even the ASEAN um, related agency should think more, what can we do more to promote people to people uh, connectivity. One is on the scholarship that we all know that Indian provided the scholarships to the young students to come to study in India. We should utilize this uh, mechanism, this, this uh, scholarship to make people get to understand each other more through education. But I like to suggest that perhaps on the scholarship, it shouldn't be only for the PhD or master, but we should think more for the bachelor uh, degree so that we can have some of young students here who come and studies in India, and that will establish a kind of the, um, the seeds of the, the understanding among the people, Indians and ASEAN in the future. The second thing is more exchange of youth program. Not only this one, but perhaps you can think of other regions, in particular, perhaps northeastern regions, which yesterday we have seen the performance by Na from Nagaland. And I myself have traveled to northeast twice or three times. I could feel the close connectivities of people in, Naga, in, in Northeast and in Southeast Asia. So we already have um, the kind of um, platform or center that calls Southeast Asian Center in Guwahati University. So we should think that how can we utilize that existing platform to mobilize the connections of students or, or scholar from Southeast Asia, ASEAN, and uh, people in Northeast or in India. And apart from this, perhaps we can think of expanded, to expand the knowledge of ASEAN countries, ASEAN as the ASEAN organizations and individual ASEAN countries in India, in the universities, like in Delhi or in big city that you have a lot of famous university. So there should be more of the ASEAN studies in those university. Ladies and gentlemen, um, apart from the people to people, I would say that enhancing connectivity is the key driver to unlock the untapped potentials that ASEAN and India have to offer. As we are now in the eras of the post-COVID-19 recovery, so our enhanced cooperation in all areas of connectivity will surely further enable us to build back better and remain resilient for the future challenges. So Thailand has always been an advocate for fostering connectivity in the regions. Perhaps uh, somebody already knows that, in fact, the ideas of community for connectivity was first initiated by Thailand as an ASEAN chairs in 2007, and now it has led to a massive progress within the reasons towards an enhancing connectivity. So apart from the people-to-people -people connectivity that I have just mentioned, I believe there are several other aspects as well that uh, will help connect ASEAN and India. And of course, that is equally important as people-to-people -people connect is help a better, closer, and deeper connects of people. Those are the first one is the, um, the logistic connectivity. So we should identify them um, that when we talk about logistic connectivity, ASEAN has a master plan on ASEAN connectivity 2025 or MPAC, MPAC 2025, which focuses on promising connectivity within ASEAN and beyond. So Thailand, along with Lao DPR, currently co-facilitate, uh, we are co-facilitators of the MPAC 2025 strategy on seamless logistics. So the MPAC is open to ASEAN's external partners as well. So I hope that 
India may therefore make use of these existing tools while you explore the possibility to establish an ASEAN-India connectivity partnership like the one that um, India already has with EU. So this partnership can then uh, serve as the main platform for connectivity cooperation between our two regions, Southeast Asia and, and, and uh, India. And we must also expedite the ongoing projects that will help boost the physical connectivity, particular the India, Myanmar, Thailand, or IMT, Trilateral Highway, which um, start from the east side, from Mesot, Thailand, to Myanmar, through Myanmar up north, up to um, Moray in Manipur, in northeastern regions of India. So this route will help, you know, uh, shorten the, the, um, the, the transit between the three countries within like seven days. And it will be possible to uh, extend to the eastward through Cambodia, Laos, and also Vietnam. So the IMT Trilateral Highway, once completed and operationalized, will clearly facilitate the movement of goods and peoples between Southeast Asia and India. And I myself have been to Moray, the entering point from Myanmar through, through the trilateral highways, and have seen the constructions of road in the Indian side that have been almost like 70 or 80 percent have been done and really smooth from Imphal. And also in Myanmar, only few parts that still under the constructions, but in Thailand, it's already completed. And also the along from, from Thailand entering into Myanmar also have been completed. So for the, the construction itself, I'll say that actually before COVID-19, um, we already used this route for the caravan tourism as well as for the um, um, informal trade route between those three countries. And even now we have heard the interest from countries like Bangladesh to join this trilateral highway as well. So this should be implemented um, to, as soon as possible when the situation is better. And apart from the, the, the land connectivity, we should talk about the port connectivities by sea, which will also open the new opportunity for the development of the economic corridor. So apart, furthermore, I'd like to, to say that, inform that as the current chairs of the BIMSTEC or the Bill of Bengal Initiative for, for the um, multi-sectoral technical economic corporations, we, and we are the lead countries of the BIMSTEC connectivity sector. So Thailand aims to push forward several agreements such as the implementations of the um, the conclusions of the agreement on the maritime transport corporations and the implementations of BIMSTEC master plan for transport connectivity in which we hope to receive the support from India. And fostering BIMSTEC connectivity will certainly help promote the regional connectivity, connectivity by connecting ASEAN and South India since the member of BIMSTEC is not only Thailand and India but we have Myanmar Bangladesh, Nepal, Bhutan, as well as uh, Sri Lanka. And the second connectivity apart from people to people and the logistic connectivity is the digital transformations and digital connectivities. They are the key to future growth and uh, indispensable part of the sustainable infrastructure. Realizing that there are certain digital gaps within the regions and that India is a champion of such technology, we shall work together to narrow the gaps further, which will contribute to the prosperities of our regions and also the economic recovery. So several activities and initiatives that have been already done and in support this uh, digital connectivity. For example, the annual hackathons and the ASEAN India ICT Expo, which have been organized by the uh, Indian government and Indian side. So nevertheless, we should explore the cooperation in this area on the fintech as well. This may include the interoperable digital financial and payment system between ASEAN and India, like the UPI that India already has. 
and this would further expand the opportunity for our business and e-commerce. And I'm also pleased to learn that the ASEAN India Startup Festival was successfully held in Indonesia last October and hope that we can continue to co-organize the business matching events for our startup, especially the tech and digital startups. And I believe that the cooperation in these above mentioned three areas, people to people, logistics, and also digital connectivity will further advance in India's constructive engagement in the regions and promote concrete collaborations under the AOIP or ASEAN Outlook for, on the Indo-Pacific and India's Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative or IPOI. This will also form a strong and meaningful basis for our relations in the next decades as both sides have forged on the uh, comprehensive strategic partnership. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to share a few points on the Thailand-India connectivity co co cooperation, um, which also contribute to the overall ASEAN-India connectivity and relations. I already talked about the IMT trilateral highway with regards to the importance of expediting the completions of the constructions and also the upgrades of the road links. But what is also equally important is the institutional connectivity or the soft size of the connectivities of the IMT, IMT trilateral highway. Thailand, um, therefore, has been working closely with our partners to move forward the negotiation of the model vehicle agreement so that once the road is completed, the operations of the highway can start in timely manner. Now there's still a lot of issue pending under this uh, vehicle agreement. So we hope that all sides could be able to sit and uh, negotiate for the mutual benefit. And as for the maritime connectivity, Thailand and India have signed the MOU on the port connectivity between Ronong port, which is in the southern part of Thailand, and various ports in India, which are Chennai, Visakhapatnam, Krishnapatnam, and Kolkata. So I hope to see a concrete activities and initiatives under those MOU, so both India and Thailand can benefit from such a collaboration. And also on the air activities, which is also uh, a crucial part to uh, facilitate the economic growth and the connects of people, cultures, and societies. Thailand has served as the regional uh, aviation hub along with many countries. And we have helped connect India with other Southeast Asian countries and countries beyond. So the numbers of the weak flights that uh, operate between Thailand and India currently after the COVID-19, uh, when we opened the countries, already stands about 250 flights. And we hope that it will be more than 300 flights beyond before the COVID-19. So these are between Thailand and India. We have several um, connectivity between the cities in, in Thailand to cities in, in India, for example, Delhi, even Hyderabad, Bangalore, Mumbai, Chennai, Ahmedabad, and, and so on. So we hope that the air connectivity, which is, will be a crucial part that help connect people to people. And for people to people, I would like to uh, say and suggest more that we should promote tourism on both sides. Apart from the students and the youth are here, we have also the tourists who travel of both country and it's helped you know, bringing um, understanding of each other. Last year, we had um, 970,000 uh, Indian tourists to Thailand, which uh, made Indian rank number two among international visitors to our own countries. And we have increasing Thai tourists coming to India as well. And it's not only for the people who come for the Buddhist circuit as before, but now we have a lot of young people who like to come to India to explore the diversities of cultures and way of life and also the historic monuments that scatters around in India. So this good sign. And this year we hope to be to have more Indian uh, people visiting Thailand, perhaps up to 1.4 or 2 million, the same number at as we used to have before 2019 of COVID. And we want to promote the understandings of 
ASEAN, Thailand, and India through what we call the Namaste Quiz um, Festival. We organize annually the Namaste Quiz to the young people within India, both online. And la last year, we start to have the, the on-site that we could have about 300 students from 50 schools in Delhi and NCR attended that uh, competition. So we want to continue this uh, project. And of course, that we want to promote the uh, connects of the young people through the young entrepreneurs uh, sector. We already organized the young entrepreneur visit from northeastern regions to Thailand last year. And this year, we will continue to have young entrepreneurs from uh, Thailand to India, and we'll bring more from northeastern regions to, to Thailand as well. So these are for the people-to-people -people exchange that we want to see more in the future, both between Thailand and India, and also ASEAN and India. So for me, I believe that um, I believe in the friendship, as I myself also be part of the, or let's say the products of the friendship program. I attended in 1987, 35 years ago, the so-called Ship for Southeast Asian Youth Program that brought me to ASEAN country. At that time, only five countries. So I went to Indonesia for the first time in my life, travel abroad to Indonesia. Then we went to Malaysia, Singapore, Brunei, Philippines, and connect to Japan. This program was supported by all the government, Japan, and also Southeast Asian countries together. And I could see that through that program 37 years ago, now we still well connected. We still keep in touch. Only last, last yesterday that I sent off my friends who came a long way from Japan, Philippines, and Thailand, the, the ship we call the ship friends, they came to see me in India. So that shows how the friendship has have been developed and continue. So thanks to the digital world that now we are so well connected through the Facebook, Instagram, and so on. So I believe that for you, you all here from a long way from your own countries, being in India, it's really an opportunity to be able to sit together in these such beautiful countries and perfect arrangement like this. So the, during this week that you meet together, I hope that you will be able to build up your relations and friendship and keep it continue based on what we already have in the past that we call history uh, linkages or connectivity, which we have shared some of the basis of the language, Sanskrit. We have the, uh, lang the literature, Ramayana, Ramakian, and Ramayana in many countries, and also the architectures. If you visit the temples in Thailand, in India, or in Indonesia, or even in, in Vietnam, you will see how we have the common architectures and also the traditions. So based on these historic linkages, and also based on the what I have mentioned, the three contemporary connectivities, air, logistics, and also the, the digital. I hope that your friendships that have been built during this past, this week, will be continued and even further deepened. And that will be the, the most meaningful that the program could con contribute to ASEAN India as a whole, ASEAN India's relations as a whole. So in closing, I would like once again to um, reaffirm Thailand's commitments to further enhancing ASEAN-India relations and very much look forward to seeing more ASEAN-India events led by our young generations, including every one of you here. And thank you so much for the excellent hospitalities and also the excellent organizations of such a big event summit today. Thanks Indian Foundations and MEA for inviting us here to speak here and have a chance to meet my Thai contingents as well as some other youth from other ASEAN countries. I'm, I feel so like young now, and I recall my youthful days, so we're nostalgic as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. I think you rightly pointed out that uh, connectivity is not only physical, or people to people, we also need to look at logistic and digital connectivity. I'm sure we in India would definitely like that someday will come 
when throughout ASEAN countries, we would be able to do UPI payments and rupee cards would be applicable and used all over. Uh, we also hope that by the time we have next round of India ASEAN Youth Summit, the trilateral highway from India to Thailand would be functioning. We, and I think uh, the next round of delegates from Thailand and Myanmar would be able to come over land through More. So, uh, and we hope that probably we take it forward uh, to BIMSTEC uh, connectivity. And I think enhancing BIMSTEC connectivity is, of course, a cherished goal. And I'm sure we will attain greater connectivity in times to come. And now, to have the final word, may I invite Ambassador Sayyid Akbaruddin to have his... We have a technical problem, so I'll just wait. No, no. Right. Yeah. So, uh, first of all, uh, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Bansal, director of the India Foundation, um, my fellow panelists, uh, Ambassador Krishnamurti and Ambassador Hong Tong uh, from Indonesia and uh, Thailand. Um, sometimes uh, when you speak last, um, you wonder what are you going to speak. Um, after all, um, I'm not a serving diplomat, I'm only a Tired and retired one. So I thought uh, rather than speak, I will use uh, the digital tools here. I see that not much is working there. But that said, uh, um, so what did I do? I decided that rather than uh, speak myself, if I have to speak last in this August company among all of you, what would all of you do? Can any of you tell me what would you do if you were to speak in this August company at the end? No, 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 I won't summarize. I would go like young people to chat GT, GPT. So I decided to go to chat GPT. And I decided to find out what this connectivity is all about. This, of course, is the map of ASEAN and India, where they are. But I thought, let me go to chat GPT and find out what is connectivity. So look what chat GPT told me. There it is. It talked of connectivity as communication between systems, devices, components, blah, 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 etc. This is the 21st century version of connectivity. It, it's very good. It's very comprehensive. It's not as philosophical as what Ambassador Krishnamurti laid out, but it is a technically correct uh, version what, of all how you can relate to connectivity. But there is one flaw in this. One flaw. Maybe there are more. But there is one flaw, and that is it does not connect our histories. It connects our presents, it connects our futures, but for countries of the ASEAN and India, let us not forget that present is important, future is more important, but the 21st century is being built 
on connections of the last 20 centuries between ASEAN and India. And that is as important as the present and the future. And that's my first big point, that all of you are legatees of that civilizational connect between the countries of ASEAN and India, each one of us. Now, so I said, okay, let me just find out what is this symbols of connection. All of you are aware of the symbols of connection between India and ASEAN, Borobudur. You can repeat these in Thailand, in Myanmar, in, uh, uh, in Malaysia, in Indonesia, et cetera, et cetera. The one thing that you will remember is when you go back from India, India leaves a mark on you. When you come to India, it leaves a mark on you. Either way, this is not about whether how these connections were set up, what was the thing, but there is a mark left on all of us. That happens in every country if you stay for long, if you engage, if there is a synthesis, there is a mark. And those are symbols of our synthesis and interaction. And these cultural remains have withstood the travails of time for hundreds of years. So there must be something in that that has withstood the travails of this long uh, gap of our thing. So I said, you know, everybody says, oh, these Indians and Asians and all, they only talk about these things. So I said, let me go to some original Western sources because nowadays West is the best. So we all look at Western sources. So I decided to go to the original Western source. I hope you have heard of Periplus of the Erythian Sea. This is a Greek source. This is what it said. It's translated also by a Westerner, Stamford Raffles. Look at what it says. In the year 525, that is 603 AD, a king of Gujarat. All of you have heard of the engagement between southern part of India or eastern coast of India and South, Southeast Asia. And it's normal because, uh, as Ambassador Krishnamurti said, in some way we are very neighbors. The difference between India point and the tip of uh, Indonesia is nearer than the distance between Maldives and India. But look at this. There was a king of Gujarat who sent his ships. And if you don't believe the Western source, I said, okay, let me go. Here is the source of a photograph. It says this is of a Gujarati ship. It is from the Borobudur frieze. Ships of this type were included and they were interacting between Indonesia and India. This is 600 years ago. Western sources, freezes. We didn't manufacture it. This is the legacy of our engagement. It has stayed with us for centuries. And whatever you do and build, remember that our connect is more than the tertiary connected between you and me or others. And that's the big point I want you to take from here, that the India-ASEAN connections, the India-ASEAN connectivity is something that has gone for generations. We need to, as uh, 21st century people, build on it. And that's my large big point. We've talked about physical connectivity projects. And we've heard of the physical connectivity projects between India, Myanmar, Thailand. There is also another physical connectivity project called the Kaladan project. Now, please remember, I heard uh, Mr. Bansal say that um, we hope that the trilateral highway will be ready next year. Let's all acknowledge physical connectivity is the most difficult. Uh, because it is challenging, because the terrain is difficult, it, everything that happens impacts on physical connectivity projects. So by their nature, they are slow, they are difficult to uh, uh, undertake, they will not meet your time schedules, 
there will be delays. But let's not forget, 2,000 years of connect, a few years of delay is not the way to see it. At any given point in history, you will see and say, oh, it's not working. But in the longest uh, arc of history, you will see, oh, this is what enabled. So please be understanding of the ground realities uh, of this situation. Now, what does this physical connectivity mean? Uh, the ambassador of Thailand just mentioned that it would enhance people-to-people -people connectivity, it will enhance trade, etc. But she was very humble. She did not emphasize on one big thing. ASEAN, all of you in ASEAN are a star attraction in terms of economic growth globally, in terms of investment globally, in terms of wanting to engage globally, you are perhaps the relatively the most stable region uh, uh, as a grouping. You are also a region which is very humble in its foreign policy. It is not like some of others who are a little bit of a union and then they say how much it is. ASEAN, my friends, is one of the most humble associations and all of you need to be proud of it. That's why you have a rising middle class. You have uh, some of the best and uh, ways of using technology. You have uh, high growth. You have everything. So if we are a neighbor, if the Northeast of India doesn't have outlets, naturally it will look to you. When we have a neighborhood which is so good, we will look to you. So that's the attraction of ASEAN for our Northeast. It is landlocked. That adds to it. It will provide access to the sea for ASEAN. That's the additional point. But neighbors like you are rare. We have other neighbors elsewhere. I will not talk about them. But you know the problems with those neighbors. Now you know also why we treasure you as our neighbors. <laughs> Little bit on the India, Myanmar, Thailand trilateral highway. It started in 2002. It's approximately 1400 kilometers. It links More, as the ambassador of Thailand said, to Mesot in Thailand, and from there, elsewhere in Thailand. It's 1,400 kilometers, but about 70 bridges, I think. Much of the work is completed. The bridges reinforcement is still going on. And the three countries need to sort out. The hardware is getting ready. The software needs to be worked out. Because you may have the hardware ready, but without the software, try using a computer. It doesn't work. So the Motor Vehicles Act is something that we have to get in place. And if this works, the idea is that this can link to other places in, the, uh, South, uh, in uh, Southeast Asia. That is, as was told, Vietnam, Cambodia, um, Laos. So it's our opening, physical opening to Southeast Asia. It's not that this has happened, uh, that this is not possible because we also had a car rally as way back as in 2004 on this similar track going ahead. But if you want heavy traffic, you have to get ready for it. There are delays, we acknowledge it, but don't look at it in the snapshot of history. Look at it in the big picture, what it will do for all of us. The next one, the Kaladan multimodal project. This is perhaps India's most challenging uh, development project that we are taking up. It links Kolkata port with Sitwe in Myanmar. From there, there is a jetty for about 150 kilometers or so to Paletwa. And from there, there is a highway to the border with Mizoram and further highway to Aizol. Uh, it started in 2000 and uh, I think it was signed in 2008. Um, its work started in 2010. 
Um, it has had problems uh, largely of a human resources issue because um, with that difficult situation, contractors have a difficulty in uh, working there. So uh, much of the work was done, but then the contractor couldn't fulfill his requirements. So they are now subcontracting it. And then all of us are aware that there are uh, difficulties in the local situation there. And so law and order is a difficulty, and that has delayed this. But once this comes, again, you see the quest is always for a port. And that's the second important project which will link us and the northeast of India to a port. And that's why these two are important. There are other maritime connectivity was mentioned linking of Andamans in India with Sabang in Indonesia. That's one of those goals. Ambassador, um, uh, sorry. The other one is direct shipping lanes between India and Vietnam. Uh, this is an important thing because all of you know, Vietnam is growing rapidly. Uh, we are plugged into the Vietnam's market and therefore direct shipping lanes are an important thing because don't forget, 60% of all trade is usually through the maritime route. And so we would like to get plugged into the fastest way. And finally, as was mentioned, the linkage between Chennai, Vizak, Krishnapatnam, Kolkata, and Ranong in Thailand. And that's again a maritime thing. So maritime connectivity efforts are physical connectivity. Uh, they are not as difficult as land, but then they are uh, a work in progress. Finally, there is air connectivity. I will not deal with it because some of the statistics that I got were based on uh, the COVID era when air connectivity has gone down. But yet, we need to have greater air connectivity because right now, it's not with all ASEAN states. Thailand is booming. Tourism is booming. Singapore works well. There are other places they are going, but we need more air connectivity. Uh, it's a work in progress. Um, when I calculated for 2020, I forgot, sorry, 2021, I forgot that COVID was there. How quickly time phases for old people like me. That time there were only 5,000 passenger flights, but that was a low period. Ambassador has just mentioned that 200 flights per week, we are getting back to normal. May I request our ASEAN friends, Indian tourists are going there. What about you? Time for you to see the world, young friends. And India is a world by itself, so please have a look at it. And as part of the plan of action for 2021-25, there is an air transport agreement that is being thought of. I want, when friends talk, we should not shy from difficult issues. So I will raise two issues. I will not go further down that thing, but they are issues. I know I was like them before. They didn't raise this, and they will not. I wouldn't have raised it. But today, I'm a tired and retired diplomat, as I said. Old people can say what they want and get away with it. So this is what I'm saying, that there are challenges. We can discuss those. What are, in terms of connectivity, RCEP, the ASEAN is too nice and humble to say, but they feel that maybe India missed an opportunity. They may not be incorrect, but they need to understand our point of view too. And there is a point of view that says that yes, there are challenges for us today. We need more space and time. We will come back. And also, in negotiations, it's never winner take all. You have to gain some, you have to give some. I don't know whether the ASEAN was sagacious enough to give some to India. Obviously, Indians are very tough negotiators. <laughs> so they will always, like Oliver Twist, say, I want some more. But it didn't work out. Keep that in mind. There are two sides to the coin. There is no 100% certainty in this. But it's an opportunity which we feel could have been handled better. Yes. The second one, again, 
I think we need to be cognizant of it. It's very nice to say that there are many convergences between India and uh, ASEAN on Indo-Pacific issues, and that's true. There are many convergences. But, you know, I am no longer again, as I said, sitting where you are. So I have the liberty of drawing up what are the objectives, what are the focus areas, and I find one word missing. Can any of you say what that one word is? You are very nice, you will not say. The word is security. That word is not in the conception. It's pretty clear in Indian conception that it is one, two, three times there. Look at the key objectives you find in Indian conception three times. Deepening economic and security concept. Strengthening maritime security capabilities. Advancing peace and security. Look at the ASEAN key objectives. It's not there. So friends, just remember, there are issues. I will not raise it, except if any of you want to discuss. But the, as friends, we need to understand the challenges too. So keep that in mind as we go forward. And my last point is that today, connectivity is no longer people to people, physical, maritime, but it transcends geography. And by that, what do I mean? You know, the world still remains interdependent. Trade is getting back to where it is, but it's a different type of trade. Trade in goods peaked around 2008. After that, there is trade in knowledge, trade in services, trade in know-how that is growing. And as Ambassador of Thailand said, digital connectivity is as important as other forms of connectivity. Look at this. This is a graph of how trade is moving. The red line is the line of digitally delivered services. The red, the blue line is goods export. They all started to make it at zero. It was not that both are at zero, but just to equalize, they started at zero. You can see where trade of digital goods, digital services is moving. Way ahead of trade of the conventional type. You are all in Hyderabad. Hyderabad, yes, has a history, but it has, it is a boom town for digital startups today. Go down to the Telangana hub, T hub. Look at it. It is as it is booming as Kuala Lumpur is booming, or uh, or Jakarta is booming, or Thailand. I think some of the microphone is on. I don't know okay. why. Uh, there is on and there it's on. Can you give, give them mobile microphones? Check. Use somebody, use somebody. Yeah. Yeah, you use this. Yeah. Hello. To all His Excellencies and Distinguished Speakers, India Foundation, and to my co-delegates, magandang umaga sa lahat. Good morning. In relation to digital co connectivity, I know as we go home to each, our, each of our countries, our way of communication to connect to each other will be through social medias like Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, even TikTok. But one problem is that fake news in social medias are now rampant. How to contain or maybe stop the widespread of fake news in different social media accounts. If cannot be stopped, 
do the ambassador supports to include digital literacy or or such or we say critical digital literacy in curriculum in schools we'll take a few questions at a time kindly introduce yourself ah i'm jansen galvez malapit a delegate from the philippines yeah next indonesian delegate yeah here in front the lady yeah 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 check okay i yeah. think it's working yeah Thank you for honorable and distinguished ambassadors and all the delegates. I have two things that I would like to address. The first one is about connectivity and the second one is about partnership. About the connectivity, I'm coming from Medan, North Sumatra. And, um, you know, I was coming here, uh, I went to Kuala Lumpur and then transit and then, you know, I fly to Hyderabad. But if you look at the geographic of, you know, the center, like Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur, Singapore, and Kuala Namu is, is in like in a one hub. So I would like to address a direct flight, if it's possible, from Medan or Kuala Namu straight to India. So we don't have to transit anymore. It's because of the time efficiency and effectivity. In fact, uh, I would like to you, you to know that uh, our airport now in Kuala Namu is um, operated by GMR. GMR is India company and we have the BOT for 25 years. And then we would like Kuala Namu International Airport to be the international hub from Indonesia to have a direct connectivity to India because we are closer, especially Aceh and Batam as well. That's the first one. And because, you know, uh, this year India will host a G20 presidency and I guess like a lot of member of ASEAN maybe will come to India. That's the first one. And the second one, uh, we all know that India is very famous for its advance in technology. So I would like to propose like a student exchange maybe uh, from India to Indonesia and from Indonesia to India. So we have a transfer of knowledge between both countries, not only about the knowledge, but about the cultural and history and maybe, uh, you know, sort of like an internship um, from in Indonesian people to India, so they will transfer the knowledge and we can implement it in uh, Indonesia. And for the economic as well, I know that a lot of, you know, fintech company, maybe it's to Ambassador Ina as well, I know that there's like a lot of India technology company would like to invest in Indonesia. It's like a fintech, but they don't really have a benefit as if they come as an ASEAN country, maybe there will be a policy and also like a discretion from Indonesia government to strengthen uh, the partnership between Indonesia and India. Uh, thank you. My name is Meryl Rauli Saragi. I'm from Medan, Indonesia. I have raised talent from Akil Bharti Vidyati Parishad. So I have a question to the panelists. So the recent failure of ASEAN five point consensus with related to Myanmar question. So do we see as a major irritant in uh, ASEAN India connectivity projects? The second question is related with uh, global maritime fulcrum vision of Indonesia and Sagarmala project. So can we move a convergence of the Sagarmala project and global maritime fulcrum of uh, Indonesia as a Indo-ASEAN based counter strategy for uh, I mean, the I mean, as a as a, one of the key chain for supply chain resilience initiative. Thank okay. you. We'll take the answers to these three questions first round, and then we'll take. We'll start in the same order. Yeah. Any question that you wish to answer, it is totally your discretion. You need not answer all of them. You may decide. You may like to pass them on. Um, I do not get the last questions on Indonesia, so um, I may need to. The last uh, question. Yeah, the was last question. Uh, last or last but one. The last one. The last. The last exact one, one was that there was some five-point consensus on Myanmar within ASEAN could yes. not be reached, and that is one of a stumbling block as far as connectivity between India and ASEAN is concerned. Oops. Okay. I'm not a. I'm not a technology savvy, maybe, ambassador side. 
can answer the the question on digital literacy. Um, on air connectivity, yes, um, uh, the embassy has been doing um, a lot of work on ensuring that as soon as possible we will have the direct uh, air connectivity between Indonesia and India. Um, the challenge is there uh, because of uh, COVID and as well as uh, you know the the dynamics um, in air transport uh, agreements uh, between Indonesia and India. We're, we're we're trying very hard to establish that. Um, and on student exchange and internship, uh, it's an excellent idea uh, because I I believe that in technology the best way to do it is to have it, um, you know, practicalities of, of it instead of uh, only in-room uh, study and uh, course. Um, that is why I think uh, ASEC is also working on with uh, India mission in Jakarta. Uh, ASEAN Secretariat is working with um, India mission in Jakarta to establish that uh, not scholarship, but it's student exchange and also visit of students and also lecturers. Um, on the last point, I just want to uh, say that the five consensus is not the main um, hampering uh, issue in, in terms of uh, the physical connectivity, I believe, because the five point consensus is actually political in nature, uh, so it, it's it's two different animals, sort of, so um, we never ever stop uh, our brothers and sisters in Myanmar to excel and develop itself uh, economically, uh, so I think um, to shift the project, it's not a good thing, because then we will leave our brothers and sisters behind. Uh, it, it needs to continue on um, and we need to ensure that the project would be uh, established soon. Um, I just want to say to uh, Ambassador Said regarding the challenge of RCEP. For sure, ASEAN is not close the door to India for RCEP. Uh, for sure, ASEAN is open the door always and we will continue on opening the door to India to join RCEP. And for sure, ASEAN is still learning itself through the process of implementing the uh, RCP since uh, February this year. We need to see the progress of RCP in the near future, whether it will be um, beneficial uh, concretely to uh, ASEAN community. Thank you. Okay, so I, I will pick up to respond uh, some some points. First, on the air connect that um, you have mentioned that you want to have direct flight Medan to, to India, but I would say from Thailand experience that um, to have the direct flight between each destination is depends so much on many factors, and is you have to think of the commercial basis that the the operator they have to look into the demand of both sides, two legs, you know, from India to particular destinations and from that destination to India as well. So for the case of Thailand, we could have a lot of flights because there are demands from both, both ways, you know, from Indian to Thailand and also from Thailand to India. And for many destinations, not only the, the, uh, on the um, regular destinations, but we have sometimes seasonal flight to some destinations like to where we have Thai uh, pilgrims to come to Bodhi Kayas and Buddhist circuit nearby. So we have seasonal flight Bangkok to Kaya and also have seasonal flight Bangkok, uh, Jaipu, which is so popular for Thai tourists. This is an example. So when, when we talk about this matter, we have to try to convince the private sector to look into the details. And of course, that uh, perhaps the government should look into it as well so as the, they may need some subsidies if you really need to have that wood. And maybe the other point, right, to respond is on the civil exchange. I do agree with your ideas and thanks for your initiative that you have mentioned this. Perhaps not only Indonesia, you know, 
since the summit, you recruit the youth and participants from various areas and fields of studies or, or their works. But perhaps I suggest Indian government to think and ASEAN, ASEAN Secretary, which is not here, but you, you, we may think of ASEAN India to have the, oh sorry, we may have the particular youth exchange between ASEAN and India in particular areas that India is a champion like IT. And now we are in Hyderabad, as our ambassador has mentioned that Hyderabad is the hub of IT, not only Bangalore. So perhaps this trip, if somebody can organize you to visit the, the IT towns in Hyderabad, we will see the potentials that India may think of hosting the exchange program, bringing the uh, youth from IT sector to Hyderabad as a continue um, activities of this summit. So that may be the point that I like to, to respond. And on the five point consensus, as Ambassador Ina has mentioned, that it's more on the political um, aspect, but for the connectivity, it shouldn't be hampered. For example, right now, even the, uh, the border between Thailand and Myanmar, we still keep the, um, the contact between the private sector. They still have a meeting between the Chamber of Commerce of the cities in Myanmar with Thai Chambers of Commerce along the border. So that's example that connectivity is, is something that still can be going on, depends on the, the interest of both sides. A um, couple of things. Um, the question first on uh, cyber literacy and uh, that everything will be on social media once you go back. My only warning is, if you want anybody to see in India, don't use TikTok. Use the other channels available. Uh, because we don't uh, uh, have access to TikTok for very good reasons. So I will uh, leave that aside. Uh, yes, um, uh, there needs to be. Uh, but the broader question about digital literacy, it should start as early as possible. It should uh, uh, engage at every level. And we all need to start looking at it like we've looked at other forms of uh, engagement. Uh, because uh, working together is a process. It's not an event. It needs to be a process at every level. And sure, India and Asia needs to look at it. Having said that, um, my next point was about, again, linked with the uh, uh, scholarships. Anybody here wants to do a master's in uh, public policy? Okay, here's my offer to you. Any of you wanting to do a two years master's or a PhD in public policy, you are welcome to join my institute. We will not charge you except for your stay in India. How many of you now want to raise your hands? How many of you want to join? See. I already have enough. <laughs> so that's the level of friendship between us. Um, I'm certain governments will work on it, but there is a lot of uh, um, friendship between the people of India and the people uh, people to people uh, connect with ASEAN. So any of you, the India Foundation has my email. Send me an email and you will get a reply saying you can join if you meet the requirements of uh, uh, minimum qualifications, etc. The rest, you are welcome to come and stay. And as I said, there will not be any fees except for what you stay here. So that's, not, uh, that's uh, in terms of people, that's our small contribution to people to people connectivity. Um, the other thing, um, that my good friend uh, Ambassador Krishnamurti raised about RCEP. I'm not going to leave it off. So I know, we all know that ASEAN has kept the door open for India to join. But friends, let's be realistic. You can't expect to do the same thing and expect a different result. So what you're asking us is join as it is. If we wanted to join as it is, we would have joined before. I mean, be reasonable. I told you diplomacy is always about give and take. You can't say I take, take, no give. So please keep that in mind. 
when there is give and take, doors will open, things will move. Uh, I leave it at that. Um, was there any other question on? Yeah, no, the other the ambassadors are better uh, uh, positioned to answer about Myanmar. They've answered. That is not uh, just for all of us uh, to know. That I said, and I truly meant that ASEAN are a model, they follow a model diplomacy. And therefore, uh, they would never do what you may think of trying to cut down one uh, of their members in the way that other parts of the world may do. But that's not the ASEAN way. And so that's why we consider them to be such wonderful neighbors and such humble foreign policy practitioners. Thank you. I think uh, this sort of an offer for all of you to join public policy at Kotilia would not have been made over a digital platform. And that's why I wanted to say there is no substitute to physical interaction. Digital can never be a substitute. Because in digital media, you will find TikTok will not work here, WeChat will not work there, Facebook will not work there, Google will not work there. There will always be cyber barriers at different places. We'll just take one final round because we've already shot, overshot the time. And I think I started from this side. I'll start from this side if we have some people. And uh, we will say, yes, uh, yeah, there, last, yeah. Yeah, 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 you, gentlemen, yeah, yes, please. <laughs> then the lady behind you. No, after. Testing, yeah. testing, okay. Um, a very good morning to the esteemed panel. Uh, my fellow youth delegates at ASEAN and the India Foundation. I am Adityan, uh, I am delegate of Singapore, and uh, I have a question for the panel, which should be that, uh, to the panel. We were speaking about in increasing India's maritime connectivity. Uh, the relations between Singapore has always been strong in the maritime trade. And the question is, moving forward in the coming years to 2030, how exactly can we improve upon our maritime uh, connectivity with India, given that Singapore is currently making plans and working on things such as the International Maritime Center, IMC, and the Next Generation Port, NGP, by 2030 as part of its maritime roadmap. Thank you. Yeah, behind her. Yeah, please. So my question is to the, firstly, good afternoon, uh, everyone. And my question is to the ambassadors. Uh, one thing that I saw that you have given significant focus is on people-to-people uh, -people connect and uh, socio-cultural connect. But uh, I would like to shift the focus to socio-economic connect. And uh, while I was reading some few numbers on Thailand's uh, uh, skill development fund and 99% uh, of the pop employable population being employed and uh, the focus of Indian government being on skill development and India having the one of the largest youth populations. How do you think we can, uh, the countries in the ASEAN and India connect better and in a more fruitful manner to help the youth gather more skills from the ASEAN countries. Thank you. OK, as the last and final question, uh, achha, I have somebody from Brunei. I think I'll give him the chance for before somebody else speaks. So. Test, test, OK. Good morning to um, distinguished guests and honorable speakers. Uh, so I have a question like, uh, currently, uh, as we moving forward, uh, youth, as the future leaders, they have to be equipped with good skills in order to carry on the digital connectivity with uh, ASEAN and India or any countries. So, uh, I would like to know uh, what could be the other ways in order to equip this youth in order to have 
in order to have the skills to prepare for the digital economy in the future. And, and then one more, uh, as ASEAN and ASEAN India uh, connectivity are facing problems such as uh, geographic, geographical uh, problems. Uh, other than act is policy, uh, what could be other ways or frameworks that could be implemented to reduce these problems in order to have a smooth ASEAN India connectivity, uh, whether to air connectivity, people to people connectivity, or uh, maritime connectivity? Thank you. The last question uh, on the first row. I'll just let her speak. Islam that is practiced in uh, Indonesia. Uh, I would like your views on it. Okay, last from Thai delegate. Yeah. Good morning. My name is Patui Anand. I'm from Thailand. Uh, I have two questions to ask the dean. Uh, in many, many people in Thailand have preconceived thoughts about India people. Uh, Many people believe that when we meet India people, the so-called cat and a snake, we have to hit a snake first. It means a uh, cat or Indian people cannot trust, cannot be trusted. Uh, first question is how India government can win heart and mind of Thai people? And the second question is you talk about uh, People to people project. How could you measure measure the? Do you have a criteria to measure the success of the project? Thank you. Uh, thank you. I think there are a large number of people who want to ask questions. Uh, last uh, Malaysian. Uh, um, test. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, thank you so much, Excellencies. Uh, excellent presentation. Uh, Mina from Malaysia. I just have one question. Um, Ambassador Hong Kong actually mentioned about um, the importance of education co cooperation between um, you know, ASEAN and India. And I personally feel that the value of the ASEAN-India network of universities, it cannot be undermined. So um, my question is, how can we better opera operationalize this? Because I think in terms of, you know, we have the DIA scholarships and all that, but I think the beauty of ASEAN-India cooperation is really this cultural arts education, and I think we need to really improve this. I, I really want your opinion on this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we have a lot of other people who are wanting to ask questions, but we'll have a break after this, and you will probably get adequate time. So I'll request now the panelists to answer, because we are already eating into the next session step. Um, we can go in the reverse order this time, starting with Ambassador Akbaruddin. Yeah. So uh, maybe I'll try and address the two questions which are similar about uh, moderate Islam uh, and uh, better understanding India. Uh, I think uh, they have a um, connect uh, in them. Uh, so the best way to understand any people is to engage with them. Uh, if you... Uh, 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 how have we understood ASEAN and the ambassadors here? Purely because we've seen them in action. We've seen them uh, take stances which are moderate, uh, which are reasonable, which are very balanced, and that's why there's no hesitation in saying uh, the things that we really mean. Uh, so the best way is to increase people-to-people -people connect is through, you ask me, what are the matrix that can be done? The matrix is pretty simple. Simple. ASEAN has a uh, per capita income, maybe two times India's, maybe more. Why are ASEAN tourists not coming to India? 
all of you want more Indian tourists to go, and that's right, India is a growing economy, and we will come. I'm, I showed you 5 million, maybe ambassador, some out of Thailand when we send 1 million. A little bit from you also would do um, uh, to come. Indonesia has a population of 200 million. A little bit more of Indonesians coming here because of connectivity, etc. So the point is that this is like a circle. Uh, the matrix will be obvious once the um, uh, numbers are, are true. You don't have to be a, a rocket scientist to understand them. Uh, greater engagement is the way forward. And that raises this issue of uh, moderate Islam. And this is a challenge for everybody that we all need to learn best practices from every other way. And ASEAN is a petri dish of best practices uh, because you've done it in a slow manner, uh, in a manner which is uh, uh, unobtrusive, but successful. Um, the challenge, of course, is that both, um, uh, to look at it, religion is a sensitive matter in state-to-state uh, um, uh, -state discourses. And this is best done uh, through non-state agencies. Uh, state agencies always, I mean, it's, I'm not saying it now that not, I'm not a state uh, government representative, but even when I was, the first thing is, the moment you say you are a state uh, representative, people look at you with a different thing. They're not going to say things openly. They're not going to do things uh, which you want. So it's best that there are institutions uh, which can do it. So let me give you one example and you'll understand what I'm saying. So Malaysia uh, has a organization for Hajj, uh, very interesting organization. Uh, Malaysia has a uh, very uh, good, uh, huge population of people who want to go to Hajj because Hajj population is given by number of millions. So Malaysia has a population of about 20 plus million, if I'm not mistaken, 25, 30 million. So about 30,000 people go. India has a Muslim population of about 200 million or 180 million, so 180,000 people go. But the uh, Malaysia has a, India, what it does is the government facilitates. Malaysia has a very different uh, approach to it. It has this organization. This organization you have to apply for. You can start saving when you are young and so that when you have the money equivalent to going for Hajj, then you can apply and then they do a lottery or in three years or five years you get it. Uh, whereas in India, the average age of a person who goes for Hajj is 55. Because the feeling is, it's a cultural feeling that after you finish all your good things in life, you've covered your life, then you go because you don't know whether you'll come back. It's the same feeling in, you go to Kashi at the end of your life. Maybe you would like to uh, end your life there. Uh, that would be the ultimate for you to go straight to heaven. So it's a similar feeling in uh, Indian Islam. Uh, and Malaysia trains everybody. That organization can do a lot of things which government of India can't do. Because the moment you start, government should train, they will say, oh, what has government got to do with this? Why is government being involved in this? Why is government choosing this, that, etc., and all? But if you have an organization which is non-governmental in nature, uh, therefore, there is no subsidy there in Malaysia uh, for Hajj pilgrims. Uh, India for a long time had, I think it's now, coming down, etc. So that my bigger point is that uh, matters of religion are best handled through agencies which can have confidence, um, which can grow. It takes a long time. Um, uh, uh, Malaysia has this organization for, I think, 30, 40 years or mo mo more than that. And they're doing outstanding job because they can train their pilgrims, they tell them what to do, what not to do, religious, non-religious, logistic, everything. And they are some of the best organized pilgrims uh, that go for Hajj. So that's my bigger point, that I think what we need to do is to look at organizations like yours. India Foundation is doing so much uh, to uh, increase people-to-people -people connectivity. Government can only do that, that much. And let's forget, 
let's not forget the roles of governments are shrinking. That's a global phenomenon. Other organizations will need to take that up. So that's my generic point. The other points, I'm certain the ambassadors will answer. Thank you. Thank you for some questions. I, I will try to respond to some that um, I, I, I feel like um, like to share. One, the first one is on the questions on the socio, socio-economic connectivities. Um, I would say that for this, you know, is so much related to the the strength of India that is needed by the ASEAN countries or even Thailand. So you have the strength, like for example, in fintech, in technologies, IT. So this is this is the kind of the opportunity, and it also come with the economic interactions um, to have people work in other countries or link. The, 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 um, the people in, in the business sector is come together with investment and trade. So if we have you know, uh, the increasing trade volume, mean there are more interactions between the traders of the two countries, and you will be part of that. And if we have more investment, both like in Thailand and India, we will see more of the peoples of the two countries engage with each other. And of course, with the investment, is will be in particular what kind of investment. For example, in Thailand these days, we have increasing investment from India in the sectors of IT. So that means it's come together perhaps with the IT workers from India and in Thailand. And in other sectors that we need, the strength of India. For example, even the English, you know, we, we have the idea to have the teacher from, from India to um, teach the students in some uh, areas in Thailand. So it's come together with what you can offer and what we need and the intensify economic cooperations of the both sides. So the opportunity is always open for the socio-economic um, engagement. The other issues that I like to respond is from Thailand on the, the questions that you talk about the attitude, the mindset of Thai peoples and Indian people that might be hamper the, um, the closer um, linkage of the peoples and also the issues of the the educate the ASEAN Indian network on the educations. I think everything starts from the attitude. Attitude is everything, let's say. So one of my my priorities in working in India is to try to improve the mindset of the two peoples. I want the Thai people to see India as India today. And also want Indian people to see Thailand as Thailand today. Of course, that Thai Thai people look to India from the somehow of the image in the old old days, and then that image can you know bright eyes to see what is going on in India. But thanks to the tourism, that we have a lot of influx of Indian tourists to Thailand even before COVID-19. So that's helped us a lot to change the mindsets of Thai peoples and Thai business sector to open more and understand realities of the Indian peoples and Indian society and cultures. Even though we are so close, we always talk that we are so sim we have similar and, and closer and deep link on the cultural and heritage. But in fact, it's a similarity that in parallel with what is going on. So, so tourism has contributed to the better mindset and understanding of people. And the exchange of the, the young people is the other issues that we want to promote as much as possible to change the mindset of the young people who will be the future of the relations. So we want them to understand each other of what we, our two countries can, can share and, and contribute to the reasons. And of course, on the education, I do agree with you that we choose, um, I think under ASEAN India framework or work plans, there is the issues on the education corporations or the university network. So we can do something that uh, ASEAN university network has already established. So we should extend to India, since India has tremendous famous universities. So we should look into the, the implement, implementations level. So how can we tap the, the strengths of Indian universities and educational system with the ASEAN strength and we should focus more to have the students in particular areas, not 
not um, generic areas that you offer right now. I always said whenever possible that for the scholarship that we receive from India, actually it's so general, it might not be so attract, attractive to the young people to come to Sardin. But actually we want to come to Sardin for some or many particular areas that we all know that you are the champion. So we may look into this kind of issue to make whatever that already exists for the framework move on and move to the, the implementations level. So I hope that this can be the answer to, to what you have raised. Thank you. Um, it's, it's easy job for me uh, to just, you know, take over from Ambassador Shed and Ambassador Patarat. But I, I want to mention three things, maybe um, in summary of uh, all questions. First, I would like to concur with Ambassador Said when he said engagement. Um, I, in my remarks, I, I already mentioned that engagement can be done by chance, but you are given the chance to engage. So please make use of it because I think COVID-19 pandemic teaches one thing, that all issues are interconnected. Health, it's not only about health. Health is about economy. It's about um, peace. It's about everything that uh, relates to our uh, hu hu being human being. Uh, so I think um, my second point is non-engagement. Non-engagement um, means that uh, in the future, um, I'm, this is also to answer your question, what else can be done? What else can be done is non-engagement is not in our plate now because the issue also is not non-traditional. Non non-traditional means health. The, the next, the future pandemic, what will happen with our health system? And second issue, I think Ambassador Said mentioned about this. Digital will also bring cybersecurity issues. That's also non-traditional issues. So, and then disaster, climate change, it's non-traditional issue. So no engagement or disengagement is not on our plate. We need to engage. And Ambassador Pang already, uh, Ambassador Patarat already mentioned about, we need to see each other as the way we see the current situation. The current situation. G20 presidency for Indonesia teach a lot of things that Bali is not the, the same Bali as previous, before COVID. Bali now is different because now tourism in Bali is second of priority. We come back to agriculture, for example. So please, um, I think uh, the youth delegates needs to see each other with the current situation and the future. I concur with Ambassador Said when we talk about the past. It is a strong, solid foundation for our engagement. But the engagement needs to also consider the current situation and the future that is non-traditional issues in front of us. So, uh, moderator, thank you so much for the opportunity for all of us here. Thank you. I'll hand over to Soumya to take the proceedings forward. Alok, sir, one last question. If that's just not feasible. Minute. Not feasible now. I would like to thank the speakers for a very insightful remarks. I would request Captain Alok Bansal, Director India Foundation, to kindly felicitate our speakers. Ambassador Ina H. Krishnamurti, Indonesian Ambassador to India. To Ambassador Patrat, Hong Kong, Thailand Ambassador to India.
and to Ambassador Syed Akburidi, Dean Cotelia School of Public Policy. We have arranged for some special beverages, local delicacies and ice creams for all our delegates in the adjoining hall, which you can relish throughout the day. We will now be taking a small break for 10 minutes. I would request all of you to please come back by, uh, by 12.15 sharp. Uh, that's when we'll start with our country presentations. Once again, I would request all the country presenters uh, to please make sure that your PowerPoint presentations and videos have been shared at the sound council at the back of this room. Thank you.